Today, we're talking about the surprisingly new neuroscience of thirst. Stay tuned. Today, we're gonna talk about thirsts. Did you say thirsts? Yes, it turns out there's more than one. Both of them promote a feeling of thirst and cue you to perform the same behavior, drinking, but they operate independently in the brain. Let's start with homeostasis. Your body has an optimal functioning range for all kinds of different things. Temperature, water content, sugar levels, all of these things need to be properly balanced. And when things go out of balance, it causes problems. So your body wants to achieve that balanced state, which we call homeostasis. Drives are the term psychologists use for internal states that promote behaviors when that balance is thrown off in some way so that you can perform the behavior and return to homeostasis. Thirst is the drive that we use to manage homeostasis of fluid levels in the body. Today, I'm gonna to talk about two types of thirst. The first is what we call osmotic thirst. And that's when the water level drops inside your cells. For example, if you eat a salty meal, that salt enters your bloodstream. Having a lot of salt concentrated outside the cell tends to draw water out of those cells. When this happens, your body needs to recognize that it's losing water in the cells and restore that balance. This problem is detected in an area near the ventricles of the brain. Now the ventricles are little open spaces in your brain filled with cerebrospinal fluid. There's an area on the third ventricle called the organum vasculosum lamina terminalis, which we're gonna just call the OVLT for short. The OVLT is connected to an area called the median preoptic nucleus of the hypothalamus. The OVLT is the area that detects water loss inside the cells and it then sends a signal over to the median preoptic nucleus to start triggering what we feel as thirst. So how do we know that it's the OVLT that's responsible? Well, simple, you can do what's called a lesion study. A lesion is controlled brain damage or deactivation of a specific brain area. If you inject salt into the bloodstream, that's gonna induce drinking. However, if you lesion the OVLT, then give the salt into the bloodstream, you don't get as much drinking as you would expect. This tells us that the OVLT is critical for detecting this kind of thirst. The second type of thirst that we're gonna talk about is something called hypovolemic thirst. Now this is what occurs when you have a drop in the overall blood volume in your body due to overall fluid loss outside of the cells. This can be caused by all kinds of things like urination, blood donation, exercise, perspiration, excess spitting, and more. It's first detected actually in the heart because your heart has pressure receptors or baroreceptors in the heart's ventricles that increase in activity in response to low blood pressure. Those baroreceptors send that information via the vagus nerve from the heart, carries that information up to the brain to the nucleus of the solitary tract in the medulla. The nucleus of the solitary tract then transmits the information on to the preoptic nucleus of the hypothalamus, just like in osmotic thirst, to trigger drinking. Now there's also a second pathway for hypovolemic thirst, the kidneys. When your fluid levels drop, the kidneys start to release a hormone called renin. This causes the release of another hormone, angiotensin II, into the bloodstream. From the bloodstream, it goes up to the brain, and it's detected by something called the subfornical organ, which also borders the third ventricle. And then, you guessed it, onto the median preoptic nucleus. So the end point here to initiate the behavior seems to be the median preoptic nucleus. Now, consider the following experiment. If you inject angiotensin into the subfornical organ, it increases drinking. If you lesion the subfornical organ, 
then that eliminates this effect. However, lesions of the subfornical organ don't impact osmotic thirst. In other words, we can tell scientifically that these are two separate systems. So now we're drinking. Drink forever? No, that would be deadly. You can actually get water poisoning if you drink too much. Once you've got hormones flowing and things like that, it takes 10 to 20 minutes before those start signals start to die down. If we drank that whole time, we would die. So what do we do? Experiments show that it can't be in the stomach or lower than that in the digestive tract. We know that because if you inject water straight into the stomach, when someone is thirsty, it doesn't stop the drinking. You can also implant a tube in the stomach so that any drinking that someone does runs right out as soon as it's consumed. And if you do that, they still stop drinking after a certain amount of time. Now, just a few years ago, this is around 2016 or 2017, the first evidence was published that suggests that sensory neurons from the mouth and throat are actually what inhibit the subfornical organ and the median preoptic nucleus, causing drinking to stop. This happens even if you just put a cold piece of metal in the mouth to simulate cool water even without drinking. I wonder if you were lost in the desert without water and you were really thirsty, if you could stave it off temporarily by just putting something cold and metal in your mouth. Wow, so we have two thirsts, at least. But don't forget about anticipatory thirst. A lot of times we drink during situations where in the future we might experience thirst. So for example, when you eat, when you go outside and it's hot, when you go to bed, those are all times when your body in the future would be looking at a dehydrated state. And so we often drink in anticipation of that dehydration before you're actually feeling the thirst. You know, that brain circuit wasn't as complicated as I thought it was gonna be. That's because I oversimplified it. We're constantly discovering new brain areas and pathways that are involved in thirst. It was recently discovered that electrical stimulation of the anterior cingulate cortex would turn on the whole system and induce drinking, but we don't really know why yet. I only mentioned two kinds of thirst here, but there may be many other kinds. So far, I've seen at least four proposed. So you see, even a simple concept like thirst has many unknowns. This is good news because it means there are many opportunities to explore the basic neuroscience of this absolutely basic system. And we need up and coming scientists to do it. You see, we're just beginning to have the right tools and technology to start understanding thirst behaviors. Of course, thirst is interesting in its own right, but it's also critical because some people have conditions that impact thirst. For example, polydipsia is a word we use to describe a condition in which people experience excessive thirst. This could be brought on by lots of different causes. For example, hyperglycemia, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder. On the other hand, adipsia is what we call a lack of thirst. This is especially dangerous in hot weather and may contribute to a huge increase in global heat-related deaths due to global warming, expected to rise 250% over the next 30 years. Okay, that's my quick overview of thirst. I'm gonna go and find a nice, cool glass of water to enjoy, but until next time, keep thinking. We need up and coming scientists to do we need up and coming. A lot of times we eat. This means there are many opportunities to just. But this means if you inject, if you inject salt into the butt. This problem is detected by an Erica near an Erica. Thank you.